Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading researchers and nutritionists meet over a few drinks and casual conversation to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, and I'll be your host for this podcast journey. First, let me tell you a little bit about where we are and how we've gotten here. Traditionally, scientists in animal agriculture gather at industry meetings and events around the world. And though the talks and educational seminars are important and informative, the place where we learn the most, the place where we solve life's biggest problems, well, that's around the table, at a local pub, where we jot down our inspired ideas on the back of a cocktail napkin over a few drinks with friends. And that's the atmosphere we'll enjoy here at the Real Science Exchange, a relaxed, open environment where the conversation, the stories, the ideas, and the drinks may flow freely at times. For today's episode, we'll be discussing what can be done from a nutrition and management perspective to increase milk protein content. The recent rise in milk protein value has many producers and nutritionists looking for ways to increase milk protein levels. We'd then like to have a discussion about net zero carbon emissions for the dairy industry and the role precision nutrition plays in helping us meet that goal. But before we get too far here, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Dr. Clay Zimmerman. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I, I grew up on a, on a dairy farm. I did um, my undergraduate work at uh, Virginia Tech and all of my graduate work at uh, North Carolina State. Uh, I did milk fat depression work back in the day. That was many years ago. I've been in the industry now for over 29 years. My first uh, 22 years were with a couple of feed companies in the Midwest and Northeast. I joined Biochem almost seven years ago now in a tech service position. It's great to join all of you today here in the pub. And I, in, in, uh, in honor of the dairy industry, I, I, I'm drinking a, a chocolate milkshake today. Awesome. So every week, Clay, we invite uh, an academic guest to join us, and we ask them then to bring a guest along as well. This week's academic guest is from Cornell University, uh, Dr. Mike Van Amberg. Uh, Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself, and I can see over your shoulder there, you've already got your drink. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, a little bit about that as well? <laughs> well, thank, thank you, uh, Scott. Um, hi, everybody. I, um, I'm, I'm at currently uh, making use of some of the Craig and more that uh, I brought along for this discussion. And uh, I hope to, uh, to uh, put that to good use. Um, my background, I, I, I teach at Cornell. Um, I grew up on a small dairy uh, in Ohio and went on to Ohio State for my undergrad degree, worked in industry for a few years, and then uh, went back for my PhD at Cornell and uh, essentially um, never left. Although I did have other job offers, I ended up here because of the, the role that they had me in. So uh, my, primary, my primary role here is multi uh, multidisciplinary in some regards. I lead the undergraduate dairy program, um, which has me leading the dairy fellows program. I advise the dairy club and I've done that as long as I've been at Cornell. I lead the development of the CNCPS at the moment and uh, I've done a significant amount of work on, on calves and heifers along with feed chemistry, amino acids and things like that. So I, I, uh, I keep myself busy in this role. Super. I see you brought a guest with you. Would you mind uh, introducing him and then have him tell uh, a bit about himself? Sure. I'd I'd love to introduce Dr. Buzz Burhands. Uh, I've known Buzz now for, um, I think it's going on 30 years, um, which is kind of crazy when you stop and think about it. But uh, uh, Buzz and I first met. He, uh, you know, my involvement in the CNCPS I started as a graduate student, and 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 Buzz was one of the early adopters of it, and was actually quite critical of some of the early versions of it, in a in a constructive way. And then he came and and did his PhD here. So I've known Buzz in many uh, ways, uh, personally and professionally, and I've always appreciated and respected him in both uh, areas. And uh, for that reason, I wanted to bring him along. So. Um, Buzz, he's also an outstanding nutritionist. So, Buzz, I'll let you uh, I'll let you fill in the gaps there. Well, thanks, Mike, and I have appreciated those thirty years. Also, I miss being able to spend more time with you. 
Uh, my background is basically um, I'm a Yukon Husky grad as an undergrad. I have two degrees from there, one in animal science, one in education. I actually taught high school before I decided that I needed to use the animal science degree. And um, at that time, teachers were paid essentially uh, at or below the federal poverty line in this country. Um, so I began to uh, get into feeding cows, worked for a couple of different countries, uh, companies briefly, um, and then um, had my own premix business for a while. And as I got requests to do consulting beyond where I could distribute, I sold that and did independent consulting um, for about the last uh, 35 years. I think Mike's right. I was, if not the first, one of the first adopters of CNCPS. And it was a game changer and a life changer for me um, at the time, especially when nobody was using it. That was also a period of time when um, when TMRs were just becoming adopted. So we had more flexibility than just feeding formulated feeds. Um, eventually, as time went on, I, as Mike said, I returned to, uh, to school, did a PhD at Cornell. Uh, in my thesis is half transition cow biology and half epidemiology. Um, and then returned, did a short stint as the tech service director for a regional feed manufacturer. But essentially, for most of those 35 years, I've been an independent uh, nutrition consultant. Uh, it's probably worth knowing that although I started my career in the Northeast, uh, I spent almost a dozen years in Idaho. And it's a very different world out there and in terms of. Uh, dairy nutrition. And that's something that um, was really an educational experience for me to see that what we think about in the Northeast and actually the North, uh, the Northern Midwest is not necessarily what everybody else is doing out there. I've been fortunate since then to be able to do training sessions in nutrition and and using CNCPS around the world. So it's been fascinating to me to um, be able to have been with and spent some time on dairies uh, in other corners of the world, Eastern Europe, uh, Israel, Japan, were wonderful trips. Um, my wife is a veterinarian who was on the faculty at Cornell in the diagnostic lab for um, <clears throat> over 15 years. So we have appreciated the uh, the chance to see um, more than just what we experience here in the Northeast. Well, welcome, Buzz, and, and thank you. Looking forward to uh, the discussion this evening. Uh, Mike, you've recently given a uh, presentation on the Real Science Lecture Series titled uh, How to Increase Milk Protein and Customer Profits. Can you share with us uh, what some of the key points uh, of that presentation were? Sure. I, you know, Scott, that was kind of fun. You know, it's a challenging time to figure out how to how to get protein levels up. We were in the middle of the summer. Um, you know, there's some there's some things that I always think about. Um, and as somebody again in the role of the CNCPS, how we describe things is really important. And w one of the, you know, so the, here's some real practical things that may not seem like it's important, but uh, when it comes to formulation, it really helps. First of all, what cow are you feeding? Right. What cow you're feeding? Do you have the cow defined uh, appropriately or accurately? And uh, as Buzz pointed out, we, we have both done a bunch of training sessions sometimes together. A lot of times, not unfortunately, but it doesn't really matter where we do a training session. Um, one of the the biggest things we can do for any user, and, and this isn't CNCPS centric. This can be the NRC. This can be any any software. Is just describing the cow better. Because what we're trying to do, you know, if we're talking about milk protein, we're trying to describe, you know, we're at the point where we get, we're saying, hey, how many grams of methionine do we need to have in that cow at the mammary gland or being absorbed at the small intestine that, that you know, will meet those protein requirements, will meet the amino acid requirements so we can enhance protein synthesis and, and milk volume. 
And many times I see our cow descriptions off by two to 300 pounds. Well, you can't be off two to 300 pounds and want to balance your amino acids at the gram level. Those two things are quite discordant. So, so one of the highlights, you know, a very simple thing is let's just characterize the cows appropriately so we can, you know, really line up their, their intakes and their true demand uh, for that, those nutrients. That's, that's number one. Number two, um, again, the other thing that I see quite a bit here lately, and this all this is a seasonal problem, a uh, yearly problem, a little bit of both. It depends on the year, but you know, if your forages are good, that's great. If your forages are not so good, that's a bit of a problem. And a lot of nutritionists now I see <clears throat> are formulating diets um, probably at lower NDF levels than the cow probably should have. And I see a lot of diets being formulated with NDF levels as low as 27%. And some people wouldn't think that's low. And back to Buzz's point about the Northeast versus places like Idaho, um, out there in Idaho, 27, 28% is probably okay. In the Northeast here, we should be looking at, you know, NDF levels of 31, 32, and maybe even 33 if we've got uh, good forages, but I even in, in I but I'm seeing a lot of dairies where the nutritionist is a little cautious about the forages, bringing in some non-forage fiber sources, but really not bringing that up. And then so I see a lot of cows. You know, if we want to optimize protein synthesis and we want to maximize the efficiency of the use of the rumen in providing microbial protein to do that and make some propionate, we probably need to make sure the rumen's functioning really well. And I've had several occasions where we could basically throw three, three to five pounds of corn silage into a current diet, not remove anything, and have the cows consume that additional forage and improve their feed efficiency. All right. So it seems kind of uh, like a little unusual. And how can we just add that corn silage in there? But because the rumen's not full of NDF, it's actually not operating uh, at best efficiency. And uh, we need to be able to get that done. You know, other things then, once you've, once you've kind of met those metrics, then it's, it's um, the, the other thing that we end up doing, and this is becoming a bigger issue on, um, on a more environmental perspective, but where are we at on, once, once you've kind of taken care of the basics of the cow and making sure the rumen's full, oh, let me go back for a minute. W one point there, when we do our evaluations of the CNCPS, the number one factor that dictates amino acid supply in the cow is a little bit unusual to most people. It's how much digestible NDF can we get in the diet? Uh, that's the primary factor that dictates amino acid supply in the cow. All right, so coming back to having a full rumen and making sure that we've got good digestible NDF and that it's, it's uh, whether it's coming from forages or not um, is somewhat irrelevant as long as we've got adequate levels. Um, but, but then it comes down to how much protein are we feeding? And a lot of times I've heard people say, well, I can't, I can't get a lot of, uh, I can't see a response to amino acids, right? Amino acids don't work. And in many of those situations, you know, a lot of new, you know, I see nutritionists, um, I, I call it the safety factor, right? They say, oh, I can probably formulate this diet to, to 15.7, maybe 16% protein or 16 and a half. But because there's so much variation on the dairy and I can't control that as a nutritionist, and, and they can't seem to get it under control with their protocols or they keep changing feeders, whatever the, the, the case might be, that they're going to add in some extra protein just kind of as a CYA thing. Well, the moment that you do that, you really don't know, again, so now you've got these multifactorial things where you're looking at, well, do I have the cow characterized? And then actually, can I detect what's first limiting? Because they throw the nitrogen in, just to kind of cover things up or any variation, but then they don't take the time to figure out what's really first limiting, All right? Because that's really the power of, of all these, these models and the software is to say, okay, am I energy or protein limited? Because if I'm energy limited, then probably talking about amino acids isn't relevant, but if I get to the point where I've removed all the protein that she doesn't need, you know, and I, I think about urinary urea nitrogen, I we use that as a metric within the model to say, hey, if she's peeing it out, then she doesn't need it. How much of that can we remove with particular feedstuffs to bring, um, then then focus on bringing uh, feeds with 
you know, more precise amino acid formulation into, into the diet. So, you know, those are a few things, Scott, I could go on, but there's, uh, you know, and then getting your relationships right with your amino acids. But I think it's the figuring out what's first limiting. And then if it's not energy, then how do we manage the protein to make best use of it? So, Mike, to, to follow up on that, so how do you go about determining what's, what's first limiting? <laughs> well, I'm only laughing. I'm only laughing because I, you know, I, how do I do it? Um, right. Well, I'm going to do it a couple different ways. One, I'm going to characterize my cows. I'm going to spend time figuring out what cow are we feeding, right? What's the mature size of the herd? Um, what group are we feeding? Um, what I really want to do is I want to have some temporal perspectives on that. I don't want to just go in and have a snapshot of the herd. I want to know, you know, over 60 days, 80 days, um, what's going on with intakes, what's going on with body condition score. At that point, I don't worry about body weight. Um, but I'm trying to figure out, are they mobilizing tissue? Are they accreting tissue? The body condition score will tell you, you know, what their energy status looks like. And it may actually help you with, you know, looking, you know, because you've got to have dry matter intakes then. And not only do you have to have dry matter intakes, but you have to have pretty good feed chemistry. Because I, I want to know, you know, I want to know the rate of digestion on the NDF. I want to know, you know, what protein sources am I putting in there? And are they highly digestible? Or do we have some hiccups with digestibility, right? I, like blood meal. If I've seen some blood meals that are really not that good, they provide protein, but they're not really providing any amino acids. So we're characterizing the cow, we're understanding the dry matter intake, we're understanding the digestibility so we can make pretty good predictions and we're understanding energy balance through body condition score. So we can say, okay, you know, we're in energy excess. Um, so, and maybe protein limited. So now we have opportunities to bring in amino acids. So then the question is, you know, in, in you could be protein excess, but still be MP or amino acid limited. And I think, I, I think that's the problem. That's the, that's the real problem that we have that you can have, uh, you know, you can have this cow that looks like she's got plenty of protein, but it's not the right amino acid blend or a lot of the proteins being degraded in the rumen and not really providing, um, a bunch of, uh, digestible amino acids, Clay. So, and that's when I look to, you know, so I'm looking at rumen nitrogen balance and then I'm looking at urinary nitrogen excretion, right? And, and, and when I see cows that are, you know, we can't change fecal nitrogen excretion, but when I see fecal nitrogen excretion, you know, kind of where it is, but I see urinary nitrogen excretion equal to that, then I know we're overfeeding protein that can't be used, right? So then I'm then I'm, I'm going to figure out all right what sources of protein do I have in the diet that I can remove, you know, and how does that affect my rumen nitrogen balance? I, I'm coming back to the rumen N balance, but yeah, I'm I, I'm going to shift MP a little bit there, but maybe not as much as you think. And then as you bring you know as you kind of formulate around those protein sources, maybe soybean meal for example. Well, maybe I can pull a pound or two of soybean meal out of there not really affect my MP milk as much as some people might think and some of the amino acids and then and then bring my rumen N balance down to something that's a little more in line. You know, if it's 190, maybe we can bring it down to 140. Well, by removing that, now it gave me the opportunity to bring in some amino acids or bring in some protected proteins that now I can target you know, I, not, only, not, only, not only do I get more efficient MP supply, but now I can meet my methionine lysine, you know, and now it's time to bring in some rumen protected amino acids because I've gotten rid of that protein that she doesn't need. And I've created more space, right? But in it, in it, it's an interesting thing because I'm doing it basically from the excretion, not from her production. Right, right. Hey, Buzz, I... Sorry, Clay. Uh, from a practical perspective, you know, it, it's interesting that you've had experience both in the Northeast and out West. And Mike made reference to the fact that, you know, the dynamics are different out there. How, how have you approached uh, or, or, or have you approached those two different markets differently from a, a practical perspective? Let me go back and just reinforce some of the things that Mike said, and then I'll, I'll comment on it, if that's all right. The characterization of I, I do, I end up doing a lot of troubleshooting for other consultants anymore. And, and a surprising number of diets get submitted to me that are <clears throat> not accurately 
um, characterizing either the cow or the environment. And Mike's absolutely correct on that. Um, I want to remind Mike of a couple of years ago when we, before the uh, dairy nutrition school went on, and we talked about having the attendees actually uh, estimate cow body weights. And um, it was crazy. But one of my favorite <laughs> comments on that was from a guy who I absolutely love and, and respect was our good friend, Dr. Chase, who came back, if you remember, Mike. And um, when we, we started talking, Larry said, well, I don't really know why we did that. I mean, I was great. I was right on. I was within plus or minus 400 pounds every time. <laughs> <laughs> And he was right. It was it was amazing when we got everybody out there how poorly we can all estimate cow body weights. Because what Mike had done is arrange to have actual body weights and then a bunch of grad students and some others of us had those actual numbers and the um, attendees were supposed to estimate individual cows and then check with us and go on. But I, I also get the same kind of errors on the environment. I get in the middle of the summer and it's still 20 degrees out and I get in the middle of the winter and it, it, and that makes a difference. Um, and then the dry matter intakes. It's shocking to me how many people formulate diets and don't try to get an accurate uh, actual dry matter intake. Um, so I, I completely agree with, with those things. And the one thing that I do in that regard that um, that Mike didn't mention, but he implied, I think, is I'm very interested in the extent to which we have acidosis risk in the diet. Because I think if we have acidosis risk, even if it's not acute, even if we're not having DAs, I'm not talking about an, out, an outbreak of DAs or something. Um, but if we have acidosis there, we've impacted the microbial yield. And um, I think that's something that I'm hypersensitive to, maybe oversensitive sometimes. But I think we're as an industry, the industry in general, the nutritionists are often um, unsensitive to the implications of that. Um, so you don't have, they maybe don't have the the microbial protein that they think they do um, in that case. So I, I, I think you're spot on, Mike, with that stuff. Your question, Scott, on, on the East and the West, um, I, I just briefly tell you one thing, one story that made a huge difference to me. One Saturday, I, I continued when I was in Idaho, I continued to do some herds in the East. And one Saturday, I sat down and I did an Idaho herd. Um, and the starch level in that diet was um, 16%. And the starch levels in the uh, Western diets are often much lower than they are here. <clears throat> And I also did a Eastern New York diet, and that diet was 26% starch. And I happened to do them on the same afternoon, and I had this aha moment. <laughs> these, these two diets are 10%, 10 points different in starch. I mean, it's a huge difference in starch. And when I looked at the fermentable starch, they had moved closer together. They were only five points different. And that was because of the difference in the starches that in, in the corns. They're using flake corn in the Idaho diet um, and some barley uh, rates of, of fermentation than dry corn. And the um, Eastern diet was using dry corn with the corn silage. Um, so there's some big differences there. But what fascinated me was that the total fermentable carbohydrate was exactly the same within, within a quarter. Uh, point on both of those two diets, the milk yield was within a half a pound actual on both of those two diets, and the components were almost identical, but radically different diets. And it sent me on a, a journey for a couple of years of trying to come up with, you know, if I asked you how much starch, for instance, should be okay in a diet, most of the nutritionists in the U.S. will answer somewhere in the 20s, upper 20s often, uh, mid to upper, B12 
because most of the nutritionists have been trained in either the Midwest or the Northeast. But if you tried to put that level of starch into one of those Idaho diets with premium quality alfalfa hay, you're going to have a, a boatload of trouble. So it's been the, the um, a basis for my differentiating those different kinds of diets is the, um, the fermentation profile, uh, which with the model, you can see that no matter which platform you're using. And that's become an important part of my um, evaluation of, of diets from, from anywhere. It's interesting that the diets in Israel are very similar to the diets in Idaho in that they're low forage diets. Those guys are really low, like 32%. Um, but, but all the rest of the numbers are fairly consistent. The starch levels aren't necessarily the same. But the UNDF intake is very similar. The total fermentability is very similar. And how they get to those two numbers is quite different. Makes me laugh that you bring up um, Larry's comment because I can't tell you how angry most of the participants were the morning that we sent them out to the research farm to do that. And I had guys, I had PhDs from around the world just yelling obscenities at me about this is the dumbest effing thing we've ever done. But what the heck are you doing? you guys got to go figure this out for yourself. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was, it was, it did turn out to be quite brilliant because as a group, they were off by 300 pounds yeah, it was and they were, and they were light. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I did for them is I had the diets and I said, you guys tell me the body weights and they told me the body weights. And then I tried to line everything up and it didn't line up. And then I said, okay, here are the actual body weights. And I showed them what happened. And, and I was really focusing on, you know, NDF and, and amino acids and, and the whole, the rumen thing came together and the amino acids came right together. Right. And uh, then we could make decisions. And I said, so how do you guys make decisions if you don't have this information? And they got, they got the point, they got real quiet and pretty humble about it. But uh, yeah, it was a, it was a lot of fun, Buzz. Thanks for reminding me. And thanks for reminding me about Larry's comment. Cause I forgot that. Uh, you know, I love Larry. Yes. Well, it makes two of us. I miss having him around here. So sorry, Clay, I didn't mean to interrupt you earlier. I just wanted to. Oh, no, that's no problem. Uh, you made the comment earlier that the, the NDF levels in the, in the Northeast diets should probably be higher than in some other parts of the country. Can you can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah. well, some of it goes to Buzz's, Buzz's point about where you're at is going to dictate that because it depends on your forage base. But but one of the problems we have here, we're feeding predominantly grasses here. You know, you take corn silage as a grass. And even though we plant alfalfa, that's only good for one year is real alfalfa. And the rest of the time, it's reverting back to the natural grasses. Um, so so that's a bump, you know, it's, that's more from a nitrogen agronomic side. But so I, what I see happening here is that we don't have a lot of byproducts around. All right. We have some wheat mids. Um, we might have a little distillers. Uh, we might have some some beet pulp or citrus pulp every once in a while that's cost effective, and every once in a while we might have some some cotton seed in there, right? But I'm so I'm thinking about non forage fiber sources. So the, the predominant amount of our NDF is going to come from forages here, and and for various reasons, I see a lot of dairies whether it's inventory, you know, and the inventory thing is because well we grew our cow number but we didn't buy any more more land, right? So now we're constrained, which means we got to bring down the level of, of the NDF in our diet from our forages. And I just, the, the cows are just not efficient and, and uh, we're not bringing in the byproducts. And I think we've got to keep that room in full. If you go back to Merton's Phil's numbers, right? If you go way back now, you know, Dave Merton's did a, a remarkable job of cry, trying to describe to us how much NDF should a cow consume. And, and a lot of times in the Northeast here with the size of the cows that we have, if I put his numbers on a cow at, you know, basically a hundred days in milk and you do it relative to their intakes, even if you're that, that 58 to 60, 60 pounds, 62 pounds, well, you, you, if you're going to meet Merton's fill numbers, you're at 33 to 34% NDF, right? Yep. And, yep. and I don't think Dave's number, I think Dave's numbers are actually quite good given all the work we've done on, on rumen function. So, so when you look at these at 27, 28, you kind of go, well, well, how are we getting by with this? And I want to play off something Buzz said 
because I think this is exactly when he starts talking about acidosis, those are the cows that are suffering from subacute acidosis because there's just not enough NDF in that diet to keep the rumen, keep the chewing and rumination and keep the the rumen full, right? Which is why I, I made the point about adding a few pounds of corn silage to a diet and the cows don't bat an eye and they keep going and actually they become more efficient. We just, we got to keep the rumen full. We don't have byproducts. It's got to be forage. Uh, whereas out there, they've got high alfalfa, plus they've got some byproducts that they can make use of um, that we don't, we don't have access to, or at least it's not cost effective. No, I, I, I agree with you. I wonder sometimes, so Merton's published that paper in 97 that had the guideline in it. And that's pre, so I can remember in a decade before that, I used to do a meeting, a producer meeting every year, and I had a talk I gave that was a buck a day basics. We were still trying to get people to do things like raise high quality forages. And, and that was a tough sell back in the 80s, right? There weren't very many people that, so when you when you go forward into Merton's work, um, you don't have low lignin alfalfa and BMR corn and people that have now for several decades been pounded again and again and again that they have got to have high quality forages or you can't be in this business anymore. So it's a little bit different. Um, I think that his NDF number works, but I think, uh, I think I've told you, I won't repeat it here, how the UNDF thing came up to me in terms of herds that had troubles and were feeding um, BMR corn and had um, NDF intake as a percent of body weight, which is why it's so commonly, the UNDF is expressed as a percent of body weight because I, when I first did it, that's how Merton's expressed it. He had one, I had herds that had one and a half percent of body weight um, brought to me that were having acidosis problems. And, but the UNDF was very consistent between conventional corn and BMR corn herds um, that were or were not having problems. So I think that's a, an aspect of this that's changed um, from what it was, say, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, we, we do have, people are doing a much better job with forages uh, most of the time when the weather cooperates. Mike, uh, during the webinar, or after the webinar, I should say, uh, we had several uh, questions come in from the audience. And if you don't mind, I'd kind of maybe like to interject some of those. The one here is, could you comment on the amino acid requirements when this uh, crude protein level of the diet is 14% to 15%? Trying to remember the context of that question, Scott. I know the context. That was a nutty guy from northern Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> you, who said I have diets that are down in that range? Oh yeah, was that you? Yeah. Oh gosh, how did I guess that? <laughs> <laughs> how's, how's that for funny? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think what, what about the amino acid requirements? I, I don't think you know. So my my initial answer, not to be flippant, and Buzz, you can come after me about this, but I don't think the crude protein content means anything necessarily. Right. My first, you know, in, in whatever, I don't remember what I wrote or what I said the last time, but my first response is when everybody, anybody throws a crude protein comment at me, I kind of go, okay, well, let's, let's dissect that a little bit. Right. So back to what I said a few minutes ago, I would ask the question, okay, what am I, what do your rumen nitrogen balances look like? Right. Cause again, the crude protein to me is, is somewhat irrelevant. We're looking at, you know, and the rumen nitrogen balance is really being calculated from, you know, how much fermentable carbohydrate do we have in the rumen, which then dictates how much nitrogen, you know, ammonia nitrogen do the bacteria and, and or the, the microbes need to ferment that fermentable carbohydrate. And we have those calculations within the model. And, and then you say, okay, I've, I've got that met now, how much, how much amino acid am I going to get from those bugs? And then what's my escape feed protein going to be? And what's the intestinal digestibility of it? So, so, uh, you know, the protein to me is somewhat irrelevant because we're going to do the rumen requirements and then we're going to do the post-ruminal amino acid requirements and use all the sources of those amino acids to make that calculation. 
I, I can say that I know in most cases that moving from 15 to 14, if we want to use that as a metric, is going to give us more opportunities to refine our amino acid feeding because, again, moving from 15 to 14 means we've removed some protein. If the cow is still, you know, if we're talking about energy excess protein limited situations, then we've created a condition where we can now be more precise about the amino acids we supply and make better use of things like room protected amino acids and some, some higher protein feeds uh, that have high digestibility, right? And make the whole thing more efficient. So, so Mike, to follow up on that, as, as these diets uh, go lower in crude protein, which amino acids should we be paying the most attention to? Yeah, that's the that's a very high priced question. Um, you know, methionine is methionine is I think always going to be our first limiting amino acid. That I don't see that changing. Matter of fact, I had somebody uh, write me and call me here in the last two weeks and say, "I think the only amino acid we should ever be worried about is methionine. I think anything else is irrelevant." <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, can't name names, but I thought that was an interesting comment. And, uh, and I'm still thinking about it, right? Because uh, I think about it in different contexts. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's entirely true. I think what he's really trying to say is we know methionine is going to be limited because the rumen bugs can't provide enough. The endogenous protein cannot provide enough. And it's really hard to meet it with most of the feedstuffs we put in a cow. All right? So, so therein begs the uh, or creates the need for a rumen protected methionine source. Once you move beyond that, it's still, you know, lysine is probably still important. And, you know, again, there's some discussions about lysine because some people would say, well, the mammary gland takes up all the excess lysine that it sees. So it, so, so what does that mean? Does that mean it's necessary or does that mean it's being wasted? You know, I, I always want to keep lysine and methionine in whatever relationship the program that I'm formulating around is using, you know, in, in the CNCPS 2.0 or 7.0. That's like 2.7 to 1. But uh, once you move beyond that, if, if the mammary gland's taking it up, I'm assuming it's using it for whatever it needs in the gland at that time to, to make best use of all the other nutrients that it's extracting from the blood. You know, once, once we get beyond that, um, I think we're still learning uh, clay. Uh, it is an ongoing discussion in our shop here about what do we do next. Uh, we've tested... The amino acids, um, you know, we came up with those optimum numbers that, we, um, that we've that we been using in version 7. We've gone down one um, standard deviation and we've gone up one standard deviation. The cows kind of tell us that they kind of like the number that we've got. Uh, we've tested it relative to energy. I think the bigger question now is how, how do we stimulate things like insulin and the signaling to make more milk protein, right? So that's not just about the amino acids. It's about how do we, you know, we always get fixated on propionate, driving insulin and glucose production. And that's how we get the signaling to, you know, to take up more amino acids and go, you know, there's some evidence coming down the road that, that you know, fatty acids can do that to a certain degree too. So I think it's, I think it's not just about the amino acids, but I think methionine and lysine are definitely first. Some data can make a convincing argument for histidine. Um, I think in some of the North American diets, we still have to work that out, you know, to truly make sure that that's always first limit or second or third limiting in the system. But I, it's there, you know, whether it's cost effective or not to supplement it. Mike, you uh, brought up a subject yesterday that I'm kind of dying to get at, and we're kind of getting long in the tooth here in terms of time. Just want to make sure that uh, from both your perspective, yours and Buzz's perspective, but have we, uh, is there any uh, uncovered elements of this topic that, that we may need to dig into deeper? And it's so love to hear that. Uh, if, if not, uh, could I maybe get each of you to kind of wrap it up with what are, what are two to three key takeaways uh, each of you might have? Uh, relative to this topic of improving uh, milk protein content? I'll, I'll give you my three and then you can correct them or. <laughs> or <laughs> I, so my question on that other session to Mike was because I am running low crude protein and I don't work, I don't formulate based on crude protein, but 
Mike, you made a comment earlier today that when you're going to go down to these very tight uh, formulations and low protein diets, oh, I... you need to have a herd that has stability in their formulation and management. Um, so I think that's important. And I also monitor the uh, rumen ammonia and look at that more than the crude protein. I got to tell you, though, you can monitor rumen ammonia. And then when you look over and the protein, I've had diets that are under 14 and I won't go. I just don't go there. It's too risky to me. Yep. Uh, maybe I should be able to, but um, should be. So the rumen ammonia, you brought that up and I agree with that. Um, the methionine and lysine, I still look heavily at that. Um, I wonder, uh, and, and those are, I think they're both still important. I had some experiences with lysine going in and out and seeing a difference across multiple herds when I was um, the tech director for the company. Um, so I saw a number of herds where the lysine also made a difference. But methionine is my first important one because I also think it gives me a big hit on uh, milk fat as well. And then the Sarah thing that I, I mentioned before, I think is huge. Um, and I think we are often, uh, or many, many diets are, are um, have a significant amount of Sarah risk in there. So those would be my, my most important things. I would add to that buzz because I think the, on the Sarah thing, that's why I'm, you hear me pushing the NDF level so much. You know, it could be a time budget. I agree with you about, you know, the herd has to be stable and we're delivering feed and there's feed there at least 22 hours a day. The feed there, not 22 hours a day, has actually been a problem that has been surprising to me here lately in the last six months. Several herds that I'm aware of or have tried to help, you know, they would say, oh, we got plenty of feed in front of cows. And you put a trail cam up and you find out, you know, from 11 o'clock at night to six in the morning, there was actually no feed in front of those cows. So you compound that with a situation of 27% NDF or 28% NDF, and all of a sudden you understand why they got Sarah, <laughs> right? right. So I, I, I fully agree with you. And my way of dealing with that is not to talk about the Sarah as much as it is to say, hey, we got to get some NDF into that rumen in any way, shape, or form, right? And if you got to do it with byproducts because you don't have enough forage, you just have to crank it up there a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would agree with your points about, uh, about the, the amino acids. You know, the other thing that we didn't talk about, you know, how much starch, does a cow need starch? How much sugar? You know, um, these diets, you know, I, I look at, you know, I always refer to the Irish stuff because I find it really fascinating. I find it fascinating that they can make, you know, 65 to 70 pounds of milk on a 100% forage diet, basically, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's just really high quality grass, but it's also 25% sugar, you know, and 9% soluble fiber and one to 2% starch, right? So I don't think there's any magic to starch, but I do think in some situations, looking at our sugar levels um, in our diets is probably, you know, maybe as we back off on starch a little bit, and this is always not something that's cost effective, but getting our sugar levels up to that, that seven, somewhere around 7%. You know, some of Hoover's data was in the seven to eight percent range uh, years ago. I, I think that's beneficial for both fermentation and you know getting protozoa upregulated. And uh, the protozoa, if you get them upregulated, they're going to supply some more lysine because they're higher in lysine than the bacteria. So that's there's a few things there that I think are important towards moving in the in, in enhancing milk protein synthesis and, and milk volume. So, so Buzz, to follow up on the sugar comment, uh, in, in the your Western diets that were running low in starch, what what were the sugar levels in those diets? So, because it's mostly alfalfa hay, they're going to be higher than they are here. So they're going to be somewhere eight plus or minus a couple points frequently. Mike said a minute ago that he that the starch level per se is not as critical. I agree with that, and when I, I made that comparison. Um, what was critical was having the total fermentable carbohydrate there. And I think that you can play a lot with whether you get that from sugar, uh, uh, fermentable NDF, soluble fiber, um, or, or starch at all. But I do think that what you do 
is, and what you can get away with is contingent on, um, I used to say PENDF, um, but it's not just NDF, it's effective NDF. I had to go, I got asked to troubleshoot a herd by a vet that's a friend of mine. He had a herd, and actually it's a former student that I TA'd when I was at Cornell. <laughs> but he's, 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 he's a great big, solid, good guy. Um, and he was in tears when we got there. He milks about 400, 450 cows. He had a diet that was 80% forage, and the other 20% wasn't all starch. Um, and he had, um, when we got called, he had pumped 75 cows in the previous weekend. And he was literally in tears because he, he uh, said, if I don't pump them, they twist. And after we figured or we had a chance to look around and Chris was with me and um, I said, the cows are acidotic. And it was the feed company that was feeding them had brought in some other consultants. And everybody said, how the heck? That's crazy. You're nuts. Get out of here. They can't be acidotic if they're 80 percent forage. And the NDF level was pretty high. <clears throat> but I said, and I, I don't like doing ruminosynthesis. But I said, it's acidosis, and let's reconvene tomorrow, and we'll do some ruminosynthesis. And the only reason that I would agree to do that is I think it would have hurt the cows more not to establish this definitively, and it was definitely a, a, a major um, issue for this guy. It's a good family. And uh, we went back, did 15 cows, and all 15 were below 5.5 five on ruminosynthesis. So I don't think it's all, um, I think you have to be careful about where that fermentable carbohydrate comes from and what, and actually I think that the minor idea of PEU NDF is actually much better than PENDF alone. But the PENDF um, is important. And I think that experience I had with those BMR herds that all had DAs, those weren't my herds. I was the tech service guy and, they, and in one month, they brought me half a dozen of these herds, which set me to looking at that. But the, the NDF level in those diets was high. You know, 1.5% of body weight. That's high. And it wasn't the NDF. It was when I dug into it. And at that time, I had to calculate it using lignin times 2.4. Um, the, the UNDF was the same in the conventional and the BMR herds. But the NDF intake was higher. But it's much more fermentable. So you, you can't put, if you put a whole boatload of starch into those, those diets, you're going to get in trouble much more quickly, even if the NDF level is okay. And that's why monitoring the fermentability profile, as well as the NDF and the UNDF, has become a huge part of what I think is important for the health of the cows, the performance of the cows, in milk protein, especially because as that rumen gets acidotic, you're not going to deliver the microbial protein and the quality protein that you think you're you're delivering there. And the one other thing I'll mention that I I took away from your slides, Mike. I looked at your slides from that session, the Balkan session you did, was the decad balance in the <clears throat> summertime, right? In the summertime, in the heat. Rumen pH drops if they're under heat stress and they need to, and they're also losing some potassium from sweat and they're losing some sodium as, as a counterbalance to, in the kidney to what's going on with potassium levels. And you had mentioned, you had a couple slides in there about electrolyte balance or decad balance and electrolytes. I think that's a, a big piece of, of, um, of this as well. I mean, I, I think methionine, I agree. It's, it's the first amino acid we need to be paying attention to. But just throwing methionine in there and not, not considering things like the decad balance and the other Sarah factors, um, that's not where anybody should be starting. It's where they need to go ultimately to the methionine. But that's not the place that they should be starting to improve milk protein. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I completely agree with that. That's uh, again, it's back to figuring out what's first limiting. And sometimes what's first limiting is not on paper. 
right? That's really what you're saying, Buzz, is that it's you got to look at the cows and understand what's going on there. You, the paper might tell you there may be some predisposing issue, but it may not tell you what the cause is. Well, gentlemen, if it's all right to change the, the subject just a bit, um, Mike, you were telling us uh, yesterday about an issue you've been dealing with. <laughs> That, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's been keeping you awake up at night, but uh, Not it's last certainly night. been weighing heavily on you. And wondered if you might want to uh, provide some background for us. So the origin of this is, uh, is the evolution of the CNCPS, actually. Not the origin, but, but how I got involved. So, so as we've evolved the model, and this started with Danny Fox, you know, Danny was worried about, you know, we had the New York City watershed. Make sure nutrients aren't running off from dairies. How do we use the CNCPS to refine our diets and make sure that we don't lose nutrients into our watershed and places like those reservoirs? So the, so the model eventually evolved to um, have the capacity to predict nitrogen and phosphorus excretion. Um, and we've refined that quite a bit. And we've been able now to do that on a, on a, you know, we can predict fecal nitrogen and urinary nitrogen and fecal phosphorus and urinary phosphorus, although there's not much in the urine. Um, and then we've evolved that also, we can predict CO2 and methane, right? And we've published a couple papers on that. So the model can be used in many different ways now, if you're interested in that environmental thing. Well, what that's done that, that, that made the model visible to people who are also in the dairy industry, because now the industry has made the decision at the highest levels that we're going to be net zero on carbon emissions by 2050. It's out. Um, the, the concept of, you know, it basically not emitting any carbon into the environment in the process of making and delivering milk to a consumer is a, uh, is a big task. And yeah, it has occupied a bunch of my time here lately, um, more than I expected. Uh, there's a lot of papers being written that would say that if we eliminated animal agriculture, that that carbon opportunity is actually quite high and we could sequester a whole lot of of uh, carbon in the soils if we just didn't have to feed animals uh, which is actually not necessarily something that i think everybody agrees with but it, it is informing some policymakers about whether we should have animal agriculture or not so 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 yeah that scott that has been keeping me up or at least busy here lately and has kept me awake a few nights because you know how do you figure out how to sequester that much carbon because you're talking about gigatons of carbon but what it means to a dairy um and i think what's going to happen almost immediately once we start to initiate this kind of thinking because unfortunately i think it's going to be it looks like at some level it may be voluntary but it may be a uh, a voluntary mandate. <laughs> I don't know if those are the right words or not, but I think I think suppliers are going to say, we need you to do this, and you're going to have to do this to be one of our suppliers. So, so, so those kinds of things are being said. So I think it's going to happen where, where they're going to say, hey, you guys have to, you know, when we look at greenhouse gases, we're looking at nitrous oxide, and we're looking at methane, and we're looking at CO2. And how we do the accounting on those seems like it's always in flux a little bit. Nitrous oxide's the worst offender. You know, that's going to come from cows and it's going to come from fertilizer. Ammonia's going to come from cows. Um, so back to this concept about tightening up the diets, I, I think one of the first things that's going to happen is we're going to be told, hey, we got to figure out how to minimize methane or make more milk so it dilutes it out. And we got to stop the excretion of any nitrogen that the cow doesn't need, all right? Because if we can if we can remove that excretion from the urine and the, we can't move the feces that much, but if we can get rid of that urinary nitrogen excretion as much as possible, then then that means we're much more efficient and our ammonia volatilization is less and our nitrous oxide production from those cows is less, right? Which means that we're going to have to be much more responsible in how we put diets together and much more precise at the farm level, right? Because because that nitrogen, even though it's not carbon, it plays into things like nitrous oxide, and and that that is part of that cycle that we've got to manage. So yes, that's what's going on, Scott. It's a yeah. it's a daunting thing. So so looking in, into your crystal ball, what do you see ten years down the road? I mean, I I know you've kind of what, what what's the industry look like? Um, what are we doing? 
uh, in 10 years from now uh, that we're not doing today and vice versa. <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. Um, I'm going to take another sip. Um, just so I can think about that question. <laughs> Since I have the opportunity, um, what are we doing? Um, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think we're probably figuring out how to do even better on forages um, and enhanced digestibility and yields. We're going to be working on things like carbon sequestration in ways that we don't currently do it. Um, you know, that's going to become a bigger part of our, our discussion on a, on a, not just a, a national basis, uh, but on a global basis that animal agriculture has got to figure out how, how do we retain carbon in, in the soil mostly. Um, that, that is definitely coming. I had that conversation again this morning, right? And even my agronomist buddies are scratching their heads going, I'm not sure how the hell we're going to do that as effectively as some of these people seem to think that we can do it um, um you know so we're more efficient on our diets we're doing everything we can to to amino acid balance at a level that we never have before in a cow right because we're going to have to be more precise because we're going to have to eliminate as much of that nitrogen excretion as possible um we're probably looking at things you know products like 3nop and anything else that will reduce methane production, right? So we're going to go in and we're going to try to manipulate the rumen in ways that we probably haven't to, to be more environmentally friendly. That's coming, uh, but we're right at the beginning of that. It's not really other than rumensin, right? Rumensin reduce, reduces methane by about 7%, right? We're not actually talking about that the right way because that would be a, a real benefit. Um, and a lot of us are, are feeding that. A lot of cows are being fed that. So there's there. But so there's all these kinds of things relative to environmental sustainability. I think the dairy industry is going to continue to um, coalesce around um, or consolidate. I'm not sure what word you want to use. Some of these larger groups that control more cows um, and do vertical integration. Right. We're still going to have regional small dairies like we do because that's just how the dairy industry is going to operate. But even those dairies are going to have to change, all right? Because it, it seems like everybody wants more greater efficiency, you know, and, and, and processors don't want to stop at 100 farms if they can stop at five, all right? So, so either processing becomes regionalized or those farms change how they, how they manage milk and they do little – not little cooperatives, but they actually differentiate themselves in other ways. I think I, I, I talked about that a long time ago. We're going to have these big dairies that make the bulk of the commercial milk. And then on a regional basis, we're going to have smaller dairies that, that do different things a little bit like Italy, right? I'll come back to the Italian model where you may have a particular cheese made in a region. It's not made in some massive plant, or maybe it's made in a massive plant, but that plant's owned by a bunch of dairy producers, and not owned by some multinational corporation. That's that's a little far reaching for some people, but we're starting to see that that kind of behavior out there. All right, on a on a smaller scale. So I, I think we're gonna see all sorts of things that are gonna change our industry. We're just becoming a very mature industry and consumer doesn't want fluid milk, but they still want to consume dairy. And they just want to consume it in a very different way. All right, so we just have to figure out how to match that. We're not, I think that's the other thing we're going to do, Scott, is we've got to figure out how to build products that the consumer really wants. So, Mike, how do you, what role do you see CNCPS playing in that moving forward? And how do you see the model evolving? R right now, so I think the model is going to continue to evolve, Clay. Um, I think the model's evolved a lot, right? Because I think the next version of the model, version seven, we are, moving much faster than we ever have to figure out how to get it out of its current Vensim shell and into something that the programmers can put into the current commercial software shells. Um, I think it's going to solve some of some of um, the concerns that, that Buzz has mentioned about acidosis because it's actually going to allow us to look at fill and flux of the rumen so we'll understand how much NDF is in there at any one time. We've actually got that pretty well where that this NDF and three pools thing along with our current passage rates actually allows us to show how the rumen fills and empties, 
right? And and how much you can get into the point where you can say, oh, how much NDF should I have in the room? And it is UNDF first limiting or is total NDF first limiting because it will allow you to make that decision or at least have some benchmarks to work off of. Um, we'll be balancing for amino acids um, instead of nitrogen um, when you look at the cow um, and have the rumen. So again, it makes it very prescriptive about the rumen has certain requirements and the cow has different requirements and here's, it'll allow you to meet them. How that evolves, um, I think first thing we want to do is get that in everybody's hands and teach everybody how to use it that wants to use it, right? I'm not one of these guys that's going to force it on everybody. We're going to do like we always do and just say, hey, here it is. If you want it, let's learn how to use it. If you don't want it, here's the alternatives. Um, um, you know, but I think it's a it will be a pretty good tool because it it allows us to account for some things that we've just been missing that you know that, that Buzz points to about where do we know and what don't we know and how do we how do we how do we make decisions around it. I think in the future um, we, we are worried about. We are worried about more of the methane mitigation. You know, one of the interesting things, and here's something that I've been wrestling with. So let's say, let's say we finally get approval. Let's say DSM gets approval on 3NOP and it shuts down methane to a certain point, doesn't kill the bugs. Well, right now, all the data that I'm aware of, we don't really see big productive responses to that. Right. Right. So yeah. so the question is, why is that? And and I've tried to help them with thinking and I, I just don't I've only got so much bandwidth. So I, I'll jump into it maybe again here sometime. But all right. So if you shut down that and you conserve carbon and hydrogen, what form is that carbon and hydrogen conserved in? All right. Because all of a sudden we have violated, not violated. Well, you can use violated. We've repartitioned all the data that we have from Beltsville that builds our energy system because that energy system was built on so much of the methane being excreted, which then led to our DE to ME calculations. Right. Right. So all of a sudden now our DE to ME calculations have to be modified, but we have to know in what form was that carbon and hydrogen retained. Right. And did it yep. alter microbial yield? Because if it did, which I don't think it does, but if it did, okay, we got to go in and understand how much. But if it didn't, now we got to figure out, okay, well, we're now definitely not energy first limiting, but maybe the form of energy needs more protein to be make best use of it. But that none of that kind of work is detailed in here. Version 7 and, and the way version 7 is constructed is ideal for working through all of those scenarios and, and coming up with a mechanistic way of of being able to figure out how to deploy those kinds of technologies. So, so that's kind of where I see the model going and, and we just keep evolving it as, as the challenges come towards us, right? And that's yeah. a big departure from where we were, but to Buzz's point, we want a VFA sub model. We want to be able to predict pH. We want to be able to predict propionate and butyrate and acetate production because that's all part of this carbon balance that we're talking about but once we were able to do that now we could be we could directly predict you know where should all of those things go to mm -hmm. what's their disposal buzz how do you see your role uh, evolving um in response to this net zero initiative I, I think i mean i'm excited about what mike is doing and, and his group and what the potential is for that for a number of different reasons. Um, dairy profitability, cow health, uh, environmental issues. I, I think it's very exciting. I have a concern about, this is gonna sound arrogant maybe, but, but I have a concern about who's gonna be, um, who's gonna be formulating diets? Because I think that it's gotten, <laughs> I, I think that it's gotten to where where there's a lot more to um, to keep in mind and a lot more to understand how the switches and bells and levers work and that it's going to um, I think eventually require more skillful um, nutritionists 
um, there, there's a lot of nutritionists that are really good people persons, some that are good people persons and cow people. And you don't have to be the greatest actual nutritionist in the world um, to, to do a good job today or, or to get paid well and make a lot of money. But, um, but I think that that's going to change. We, we're going to need more skill from the nutritionists as, these, as the model gets uh, more sophisticated. Um, and I think even if the model didn't get more sophisticated, as the industry gets more, uh, as, it, as it evolves, independent of this change in what the priorities are, um, you have bigger dairies, uh, fewer, fewer farms, fewer customers. Um, it's more competitive. And as the size of those farms change, um, there's big dollars there. And I think in some cases, people aren't getting, meaning farmers aren't getting what they, they're paying for because it does take, it's just like Mike said, there's no reason for me to get a diet to troubleshoot that doesn't have the environment and the cow characterized correctly. And that's, that's at a very simple level. The number of people that can follow the model through all the pieces. One of the one of the fortunate things in my life was that I was there as the model emerged, and there was more people, and more the extension um, was service was bigger. The um, there was more more opportunities to understand the basics, and I don't think that those opportunities are as as widespread as they were 30 years ago when it was just coming on. And um, I think that this this people part is going to be an important thing. So to answer Scott's question, I, I think that um, we nutritionists are going to have to also get sharper as Mike sharpens the um, as Mike sharpens the model. Yeah, no, that's a great point, Buzz. I, I get concerned about the same thing. I don't vocalize it as much because when I start vocalizing some of those things, people think I'm, you know, being negative, so to speak. Um, but yeah, at one point there were, you know, the modeling effort was Dan Fox, Charlie Sniff, and Jim Russell, Alice Pell, you know, um, Pete and several others, you know, plus you and me and everybody else, the, 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 the cast of characters around that whole structure. We don't have that cast of characters and we don't have the structure anymore. So it's not just who's going to do it, but, but you're right. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know who's actually learning this kind of stuff and evolving their thought process. And how do we make ruminant nutrition as precise as monogastric nutrition, mm -hmm. right? That's really what it comes down to. If somebody asks me really hard questions, I'll say, I want to be able to formulate a diet for these cows, just like you do for a group of finishing pigs or a lactating sow, right? And, and, and be that precise and kind of just floors people. Like, what do you, how do you think you can do that? Well, mm -hmm. I think we can do it relatively easily as long as we stay to some certain principles i said the application of it to your point the application of it is much much harder mm -hmm. right and it does take time mm -hmm. yeah hmm. great conversation guys uh want to give you both an opportunity maybe just kind of sum up the discussions today maybe uh some just a couple re real key uh takeaways for for the audience uh buzz when we start with you um, I, I think our discussions on milk protein have been uh, useful. It's always a good refresher. I think when you asked us both, you know, what's your top three and our top three overlap on two and we each have one that the other one didn't mention. Um, it's good to be reminded of all those things. So I enjoyed that, that bit. Um, and in the, in the latter portion here, talking about the future, the environmental aspects of this, and uh, Mike's description of version seven coming, and the implications of environmental pressure and, and the popular pressure 
um, that's daunting to me. Um, and realistically, I probably won't have to deal with it. <laughs> In 2050, I'm not going to be worried about it. <laughs> I'm not sure in 2050 I will be either. <laughs> I would be uh, 2050. I would be 89, 90. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I, when I'm 90 years old, I don't think I want to be worried about this stuff. <laughs> Man, who knows, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not that different than Pete, though. You'll still be going strong. Yeah, I was the same. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. (laughs) All those great ideas will still keep bubbling out. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I'm. I'm sure that's true. That's what my wife keeps telling me, Buzz. That's what my wife says. When are you going to slow down? I don't even understand that. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I don't know, Scotty. Summarizing some things here. You know, I always look at the dairy industry as a place of great opportunity. It still is. We always. We always have. battles to fight but uh you know in in terms of everything we talked about you know milk protein milk protein just diet efficiency i think one of the things that i want to leave that we didn't really talk about um because i know there's a lot of discussion about this outside and i don't want to create another uh open-ended uh point here as we wrap up but you you know i I think there's a lot of discussion about first limiting nutrients right and I, i see people out there saying well there's no first limiting amino acid, right? It's always got to be a profile of amino acids. Well, that may or may not be true all the time, but I also don't think about it as um, add this amino acid and get more milk protein. I think the things I want people to, to leave them with is that, you know, think about think about meeting the nutrient requirements of the cow in a way where you make her more energetically efficient, right? And that, and that by meeting the most limiting nutrient what you're really doing is you're you're allowing her to fill metabolic pathways in a way that are just more efficient so she can increase her feed efficiency in a way we don't talk about it that way but that's really what she's doing and she makes more energy corrected milk cuz we could talk about well did you get a protein response a fat response or a milk volume response or did you get all three and a lot of times you know buzz said it if i get my methionine right i get more milk fat too well, that methionine, did that methionine carbon go to milk fat or did it just spare some carbon that went where the cow really wanted to put it? And that's really what it's telling us, All right? So in the end, a lot of this stuff is not about these linear relationships between I'm going to add an amino acid and get more milk protein. It's about I'm adding the nutrients that she requires and overall that's going to make her more energetically efficient and I'm going to reap some reward from that because she's going to make more nutrient-rich milk. You know, and that's that's kind of how I think about this stuff. That's probably my best parting idea or thought. All right. Excellent. <laughs> Outstanding. Listen, guys, just to wrap it up, I, I want to thank both of you. You know, uh, as I think about our industry, it, it it's unique. The dairy industry is, is, is a unique industry with some very high quality, unique people. And I got to tell you, you're, you're, you're two of the best. You're two of my favorite. And I, I want to thank you for being uh, two of the first guests here to uh, Real Science Exchange. Um, and in closing, I'd like to invite people that may be listening in to join us at the Real Science Lecture Series. Uh, we've got approximately 15 future and existing uh, webinars uh, by, by various industry experts. And you can go to Balkim anh.com slash real science to sign up for those and to hear the past uh, presentations. Uh, The next real science exchange will drop in two weeks and we'll feature a round table discussion on transition cow physiology. It's going to be featuring uh, five uh, industry experts, uh, Dr. Heather White from University of Wisconsin, Maya Zakut from the Volcani uh, Center in Israel, Dr. Adam Locke from MSU, Uh, Laura Hernandez, again, from uh, University of Wisconsin, and Joe McFadden uh, from Cornell University. And so I would like to thank everybody for attending this first uh, Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour. Conversations are sometimes spicy and usually satisfying, and you're always among friends.